Hello and welcome to another video from the only source of information that you need to not only survive the current apocalypse, but actually enjoy it. And today we're going to be talking about mammon. If you're not familiar with this word, probably because it's not an English word, but also it may not be in your translation of the Bible. I think a lot of Bibles translate this as money. Uh, but it, it's found in the King James Version at Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24, as well as Luke chapter 16 and verse 13, where it says that no man can serve two masters. He's either going to hate the one and love the other or vice versa. You cannot serve both God and mammon. Now, when I, when I started investigating this, I knew that it was translated as money in some places, and if you looked it up, it would say money in a dictionary or whatever, any kind of Bible reference. But I knew that there were Greek and Hebrew words that could be translated as money, and it didn't make any sense to me that they would use a different word here at these verses unless the, uh, the meaning of mammon is somehow different than the meaning of money. And I did a lot of research on this. because It just got into my head one day that I really was curious about why a different word was used here. And so, as, as I was doing my research, I started to think this probably is something from another language. It wasn't a, maybe it wasn't a, a Greek word, and so when uh, King James translated it, or even before that, when the Roman Empire translated into Latin, they cho chose to leave this word untranslated for some reason, and uh, it, so it may, they may not have understood what it meant. And, uh, and King James kept that tradition up. So I thought, well, maybe there would be a word in Hebrew that was similar to this. So I got my Hebrew dictionary out, uh, concordance, lexicon, whatever it's called, and I just got into the M's, and I went to M-A-M to look at whatever words may be really close to mammon. I didn't find anything, so I just... So I, I decided to just go to all words that started with M-A. And it's not that many. It didn't take me long, maybe 15 minutes to go through there. And I found a word in Hebrew, matmon, M-A-T-M-O-W-N. And I thought, well, that might be it. And, and matmon may not sound like mammon, but uh, in all the years I've been doing this, it's like you just start learning patterns for why didn't different languages use different words, and so you can kind of uh, get a feel for where a word might have come from, from one language, by looking at similar words in other languages. So I knew automatically Matt Mound sounded very, like a good possibility. So I looked up what Matt Mound meant, and it said hidden treasure, and I was like, aha, now we're on to something, because I had seen that mammon in some versions meant treasure. So hidden treasure in Hebrew and treasure in Greek, the, the two words sounded alike. So I went into the Bible and looked up every place where the word mat mound appeared. And so uh, th this word is, uh, it's in the Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, if you know what that is, and the word number is H4301, H meaning it's a Hebrew word, and it's 4,301, number 4,301 in the Hebrew catalog. So uh, a couple of places where this word is found is Genesis 43, 23, and Jeremiah 41 and verse 8. And this Matt Mound is very unique. Uh, if you go to the concordance, there's an old, old definition from way, way back that says it's hidden treasure, but let me see here, I got it wrote down. Hidden treasure, especially treasure hi hidden in grain. It's like, wow, that's a really, really weird uh, treasure that's hidden in grain. But in Genesis chapter 43 and 23, it uses this word. It's kind of uh, interesting. And and so we'll go into that in a minute, but I'm going to give a, a brief uh, historic account of where money came from, according to the Bible. 
in the very beginning when it's describing the Garden of Eden, the Bible says that there's a river that flows out and it splits up and it goes into these different lands and there's one man, land that has, uh, is especially known for gold. The land is filled with uh, very, very high quality gold. And so I think that is, that's the first mention of gold in the Bible. And it's mentioned around the, the verses where it's describing where man is placed and where other things are relative to man. And it's almost like this, uh, this gold was somewhere other than where man was, and that man was not supposed to go into that area. You know, that's just speculation. That's not anywhere in the Bible. But it does seem that way because it's, it's in the same account where it says that Satan uh, offered Eve a piece of fruit that she knew she wasn't supposed to eat. And if you get later into the Bible, there's a verse that's really weird, and it's about um, this woman being chased by a king, and it says that he taunts her with golden apples in frames of silver, which I don't even know what that means, but uh, it's it does it's it relates the apple to being something that's highly desirable, and it associates it with gold which is highly desirable and so it seems to me that somehow whatever went on in the Garden of Eden involving this piece of fruit and this gold and Satan and Eve uh, is related to the history of money or the history of the banking system because that's what this is really all about as we as we are about to find out mammon isn't just money it's the banking system itself and it's not just any banking system. It's a very specific banking system. So uh, a little later we are introduced to a man named Abraham and in several verses it talks about how Abraham became very rich. He, he, and he didn't just become rich with animals and, and plants and uh, tribal members but it's like horses and you know all the things that Job was rich with. But it says that he became rich with, with money, with gold. And there's a, a few stories in the Bible about the patriarchs. It's Abraham, I, his son Isaac, and Isaac's son Jacob that are related to God blessing them with money, with gold. And uh, it seems like the gold is constantly growing. Like initially Abraham had a bunch, and then by the time Isaac came along, Isaac got some, and Abraham's became his, and then when Jacob came, he had a bunch of gold. But uh, it says that there came a time when there was a famine in the land. And that this actually happened several times in the Bible, where the, the patriarchs ended up leaving the land. But it got bad enough that uh, Jacob <clears throat> sent his sons off to Egypt to buy cereals or grain. or uh, It's translated a lot of different ways in different versions of the Bible. But what had happened is that one of Jacob's sons was sold by the others into slavery in Egypt. And uh, through circumstances, this son, Joseph, became the second most powerful man on earth, uh, second only to Pharaoh himself. And the reason that happened is because he had a dream, or Pharaoh had a dream, that there would be, as Joseph interpreted it, the dream meant that there would be seven years of plenty and then seven years of famine. So Joseph said, you know what would be a really good thing for you to do is get some guys that know it, that are able to organize people and put them in charge of saving grain. We're going to have a, a, a whole bunch of grain for seven years. Every year just take a percentage of that grain and store it. And so they put it into these, uh, like it wasn't silos, they were underground I believe. So they put all this grain in silos so that by the time the famine began, the, they had all of these huge pits that were filled to the brim with grain. And so people knew that. And so other cultures around there, the, the Egyptians, were going to the Egyptians seeking out something to eat because there was a famine. And so when Joseph's brother showed up, this uh, Joseph was in charge of selling the grain 
to the surrounding nations for money. And he did the same thing with his brothers. <clears throat> I know this story sounds like it's just going to go on forever, but, it, but it's a really good one, so hang in there. So Joseph, uh, with using some, he wanted to test out his brothers, and if you know the story, he took their money and he put it back in their saddlebags, and they got caught. And uh, he, he uh, was able to trick the entire family into coming back because he accused them of this crime and he said, I'm going to keep your brother and I'm not going to let him go until you come back with your father and your brother or whatever. And so they all came back. So the entire uh, family of Abraham, uh, Jacob's kids, and, and, uh, and all the other people that were associated with their tribe, they all ended up in Egypt. And so... When they wanted grain, they had to pay for the grain with all the gold that Abraham had been blessed with, all the gold that Isaac had been blessed with, all the gold that Jacob had been been blessed with. So by the end of the famine, <clears throat> the patriarchs, Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all their kids were broke, but they had survived. They, they had wisely used their money in order to purchase food when they had no food. So... <clears throat> this that's not the end of the story where they stored this this food in those grain mills that was mammon that was the very first time that uh, mammon was mentioned Matt mound and that's where all that gold all the gold that god had blessed the patriarchs with had ended up in these money pits just filled with money so, as most of you know, as the story goes, um, after a while, the Pharaoh who was friends with Joseph died, and his son became Pharaoh, and his son, and his son, and so on, until eventually nobody remembered the great things that were done by Joseph, and so they didn't remember Joseph's family. So, uh, over the course of time, the Israelites became slaves in Egypt. That's when Moses came along to free uh, God's people, his, his family, the, the Israelites. Well, as part of that, there are these plagues where, you know, the Pharaoh will not allow Moses to take his people out, and the f plagues get worse and worse and worse until finally Pharaoh can't take it anymore, and he says, get out. You know, get out of Egypt. Go away. Go worship your God. Well, <clears throat> as part of that account, something that nobody ever talks about is that the Israelites plundered the Egyptians. In other words, they took everything. It says they took rings and they took coins. They just they completely stripped all of Egypt of its treasure. And where did they get that from? From that original money that was stored in those mat mound, you know, those grain silos. So here's this grain, which is something real, something that they needed, and they exchanged it for money. And then they went back and got the money, or the gold. And that's what it, it calls it. It calls it gold. And so <clears throat> that, that gold travels with the Israelites into the Promised Land. Now, if you remember what they did with that gold, as soon as, as uh, God talks to Moses about living by instinct, going back, rejecting Egyptian law, rejecting all human laws, and living by God's law, Moses goes up and gets the Ten Commandments. But as the Bible describes, the Israelites rejected God's commandments. And uh, in fact, uh, as part of that, they worshipped a golden calf. It said everybody in the, in, the, in the nation was donating gold towards making this calf that they could worship. So when Moses comes down and sees them worshipping this calf... He breaks the, the law that God gave him, and God says, well, come up and make a, another law. A, and, a, and the law is called the disgusting law or the evil law. And so he does that. Moses goes up, and then next time he comes down, he brings his own copy of the Ten Commandments with all of these loopholes added, you know, the what they call the law of Moses. And, uh, and they take that golden calf... Now, this is kind of weird, but it's, it's, I think it's obvious that uh, what I'm telling you is true. The Bible says that they ground up, they burnt the calf. 
they put it in fire and they they burnt it all up and they took the ashes and the gold and they ground it into a fine powder and they put it in water and they made the entire nation drink from that water so all of that golden calf ended up in the body bodies of those Israelites now uh, this is only it's only speculation but it makes perfect sense because after that even though they put their gold into making this golden calf after that the Israelites once again have gold so where did they get that gold well logically gold was in their bodies it had to come out of their bodies in their feces so basically all of the Israelites very likely saved up their feces and went through and meticulously went through their feces and plucked out those little specks of gold so they had their gold once again so time goes on and the gold is spoken of a couple of uh, in a couple of other verses but uh, we get to the reign of Solomon this is where things get really really interesting Solomon makes the Israelites give him the gold and he demands and he was he was king for 40 for 40 years Solomon demanded a yearly tax of 666 talents of gold every year now if you go back into that law that was given to the Israelites when they when they rejected God's law they uh, were given this other law which said not only did they have to rest on the Sabbath that's every seventh day but they had this cycle of years that were Sabbath years where they were not allowed to work any for the entire year but remember it says very clearly that Solomon, de Solomon demanded a payment of 666 talents of gold every year that means even in the rest years the Sabbath years the Israelites had to work to make gold to pay Solomon now that's 666 ends up in the book of Revelation and people are like people if you accept the mark of the beast what are you accepting well it's 666 what you're accepting is that banking system the system of exchanging gold <coughs> for favors for paying taxes and gold etc but it's interesting that he chose that number six because remember they had a seven day week which meant that for six days they could work but on the seventh day they they could not work they had to rest so by demanding it, that gold in payments of 666 talents it was signifying that they no longer had a seven day week because the Sabbath had been removed these people were working around the clock so even though they they rejected God's law which demanded ob observance of the Sabbath they were also rejecting the wicked law which still demanded the observance of the Sabbath they had gone from a six seven day week to a six day week and it's even more uh, important than what you think I made a video a while back called uh, gold on the plains of Dura about what happened to the Israelites once they had rejected God's law and rejected the law of Moses they were dragged off into captivity in Babylon and as part of that the Babylonians seized everything that the Jews had and they found all of those pallets of gold so all of those 666 talents of gold that Solomon got every year they took them out onto this area called the plains of Dura in our English Bibles uh, plains of Dura most likely is not a real place it simply is uh, translation translates into the hard plains so an area because Dura means hard so there's an area that was just solid rock and they started stacking that gold up and uh, Nebuchadnezzar was able to create a tower out of gold and it calls it an idol <clears throat> or something like that and and all of the, the Israelites are forced to go out there and bow down to this idol at a certain time. Well, that idol was made up of those talents of gold, which, remember, were made up partially of the gold that was in the golden calf, partially of the gold that had been given to, uh, had been used to purchase that grain, the gold that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were able to acquire while they were living in the promised land. 
Uh, very likely the very beginning of the gold was that gold that was mentioned right outside of the Garden of Eden. So eventually the Israelites or, uh, or the Babylonians are conquered by the, the Persians. And so the Israelites become the property of the Persians. Uh, the Persian uh, Cyrus the Great uh, allows the Israelites to go back home to the Promised Land. And he takes, he's taken the gold from Babylon and he gives it to the Israelites, or part of it anyway, to go back home and rebuild the temple because the temple had been destroyed when the Babylonians conquered it. Now, if we, we look at, at uh, that gold that the Babylonians had and that the Persians ended up with and that eventually was given back to the Israelites, we just have to know that at some, some place within that empire, the vast majority of the gold was still stacked up in reserve. So it was the nation of, of Babylon was based on the fact that it had this gold reserve, which was conquered by the Persians. But then we know for a fact that the Persians ended up getting conquered. And the gold disappeared for a time. But we know that the, when the Egyptians were conquered, it was by the Assyrians. The Assyrians were conquered by the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians were conquered by the Greeks, the Greeks by the Romans. And then the Bible came to a conclusion. Nothing else was written. But we know for a fact that the Romans were eventually conquered by the British Empire. And as part of that, the British Empire broke off and was defeated in battle or in warfare by the Americans. And we know, like, we can trace historically uh, not necessarily the gold from the Garden of Eden, but historically we can trace all the way back to the Roman Empire and how it acquired the gold. We know that the British got the gold. We know that the Americans got a lot of the gold. And so all of the gold that supports our current modern world's banking system had its origins right there at the Garden of Eden. It had its origins in that golden calf. It had its origins in the feces of the Israelites who were forced to drink that gold. And so when Jesus said that you cannot serve both God and mammon, he was talking about the banking system of this empire, which according to tradition uh, is based on the gold in Fort Knox, but which many believe is in the uh, Swiss, Swiss bank accounts or whatever, Swiss uh, vaults. But all of that gold, all of the gold that supports this system of control is that mammon that, that Jesus said you could not serve. If you serve the banking system, you cannot serve God. You're either going to hate one and love the other or vice versa. And so there you go. <clears throat> when Jesus was talking about the mammon, he was talking about a very specific thing that we can trace both scripturally and historically and there is absolutely no no room for uh, for compromising this the, the, it for a fact the gold that Abraham had is the gold that is su supports the entire global banking system right now this is part of a lot. There's a lot more information involved with this that I actually uh, wrote. I've got probably six scripts just about the banking system that I never completed. Uh, eventually I will, but for right now, I thought y'all would be interested in that. That's kind of a really cool thing that the rest of the world does not know. That's why when you, you ask somebody who sits in a church every Sunday what mammon is, they really don't know. If you don't want to survive, don't listen to me.